All right, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Wiesendanger from uh, University of Hamburg. Uh, so take it away. Yeah, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are located. Uh, so first of all, let me thank Shankar for two reasons. First of all, for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. And second, for highlighting the extreme importance of uh, disorder for my Rana physics. And this is exactly what I would like to address in my talk. So I will basically focus on the emergence of my Rana states in disorder free chains, uh, magnetic chains on superconducting substrates, which are fabricated bottom up with the help of a scanning tunneling microscope tip. And uh, we are building basically magnetic chains on very clean superconducting substrates like rhenium and niobium, as you will see in my talk. And then basically the SDM technique can be used to probe the spin texture of the chains, as well as the emergent uh, electronic states of the systems, especially uh, end states, which we are looking at, but also uh, states, of course, uh, within the chain to probe the bulk boundary correspondence. So let me first start, of course, uh, by introducing this platform, which has uh, not been focused uh, on so far. So it has been predicted that if you uh, bring a spin chain, for instance, a chain of uh, single magnetic impurities in contact with an S-wave superconductor, then you might see under favorable conditions the emergence of Majorana bound states at the ends of those chains, in addition to the trivial Shiba states, which you always have if magnetic impurities are interacting with a superconducting substrate. So uh, this theory has been pushed forward by many theorists in the past. I only uh, show here uh, three uh, examples of references. And of course, there has been also uh, preliminary work on this platform, especially by the Princeton group. Uh, however, in their case, they used uh, self-assembled nanowires, uh, which uh, actually are not of uh, single atom width and which exhibit quite a lot of disorder. So um, uh, in my talk, I will focus on disorder-free single atom chains as indicated here in uh, this kind of schematics. Now, of course, you all know about uh, the basic physics behind this platform. So the idea is that uh, you start with a single magnetic impurity interacting with an S-wave superconductor, but then you build a one-dimensional chain so that you basically hybridize the Shiba states of individual atoms and finally form a one-dimensional Shiba band. So this I will show you later on very nicely uh, from the single atom level to uh, extended chains. Then of course, high spin orbit interaction is needed. So we will see that we will get that by the appropriate choice of the superconducting substrate. Then a magnetic state is needed in the early theoretical work. Some helical magnetic state was assumed. Later on, it was shown that a collinear ferromagnetic state combined with high spin orbit coupling is sufficient for realizing the physics which we would like to look at. And of course, superconductivity is needed, uh, which uh, of course is provided by uh, the superconducting substrate. And under favorable condition, we can uh, really induce by proximity a topological superconducting phase in this chain system. And and uh, then as boundaries of this topological superconducting state, uh, we expect, of course, then zero energy modes. That is, we get a, get a closing here at the ends of the chains. And if we would plot the local density of states as a function of energy, we would expect a very pronounced peak right at zero energy. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this means that we should look at this local density of states with very high energy resolution. But in addition, of course, uh, and that is in contrast to transport experiments, we should also look to the localization of these zero energy modes. So whether they are really localized at the ends of the chain, uh, what is the localization length typically? And so you see it's a very demanding type of experiment. First of all, we need to fabricate single atom chains without any disorder then we need to probe, of course, the spin texture of those chains. Then we need to do very high energy resolution spectroscopy. And we need basically atomic resolution to probe the spatial nature of these zero energy modes. 
So uh, as far as I know, there's only one technique which can do all that simultaneously. And this is the technique of spin polarized or spin resolved scanning tunneling microscopy. That's a technique which we have pioneered about 30 years back in time. Uh, this allows to correlate atomic level structure, local electronic structure and spin structure at ultimate spatial time and energy resolution. The basic idea is that you functionalize your STM probe tip with a magnetic coating or with a magnetic cluster or sometimes a single magnetic atom uh, does also work. And um, you just have to make sure that you have a, a very well defined uh, spin orientation uh, at the front uh, uh, atom of your tip. And then you can basically look at spin polarized tunneling uh, between the tip and the sample and the spin polarized tunneling current will depend on the cosine of the angle between the magnetic moment uh, of your sample and the magnetic moment of your tip. So basically that means you are looking to the projection of the local surface magnetization onto the spin quantization axis, which is given by the spin orientation of your probe tip. So only by having control of the spin orientation, you are able basically uh, to see to which orientation of the spins you are sensitive to. And the spin contrast is basically governed by the spin polarization of the states of sample and tip. So for an arbitrary sample, you would like to do experiments with a very high spin polarized tip. So I will come back to that point later on. Now, in addition uh, to these kind of capabilities in order to construct such chains, uh, you of course have to combine these capabilities with a wonderful tool of single atom manipulation. Uh, this technique was pioneered by Don Eigler and co-workers in the early 90s. Uh, we have basically succeeded in combining this technique of single atom manipulation with spin sensitivity. That is uh, about 11 years back in time, we showed that even at these very low tunneling gap resistance uh, um, uh, status uh, while doing the manipulation, uh, we can still preserve the spin uh, orientation and the spin states, both of the probe tip as well as of the single atoms. This is extremely important because if you do uh, successive manipulations of many atoms, uh, then of course you do not want uh, the spin uh, state of your tip to change because otherwise you cannot compare results at the different stages of your experiment. Now, finally, the final concern is, of course, the appropriate choice of a superconducting substrate. Uh, that has been discussed already in previous uh, talks. So, of course, we would like to have a superconductor uh, being uh, superconducting uh, under normal pressure conditions. So, uh, uh, we should basically look to those elements which are uh, still visible here. Then we need a, a reasonably large gap size of uh, our superconducting sample. This means we also have to have a reasonably high TC. So we only consider elements which have a TC at least on the order of one Kelvin or above. Uh, so that limits the choice to those elements I'm uh, showing you here. Now, since we want uh, to have high spin orbit coupling, of course, we first have to look at elements here in this row. Um, now, thallium, as it has just been pointed out, is a very toxic material, so we don't want to do experiments uh, with thallium. Now, lead is a bad choice for our types of experiments because nobody in the world could demonstrate reproducible single atom manipulation on lead surfaces. So we end up with uh, rhenium, uh, tel uh, thallium, uh, uh, tantalum, sorry, uh, and lanthanum also has uh, similar problems as lead. But we also look into niobium and we will see uh, whether the uh, spin orbit coupling strength for niobium is sufficient uh, to observe my runner physics. So uh, since the time of my talk uh, is limited, I can only discuss results on rhenium and niobium, but not on tantalum. So uh, let me now uh, show you, first of all, what we are seeing if we just deposit individual iron atoms, for instance, on a superconducting substrate like rhenium in a 0001 surface orientation. So we get the individual iron atoms from an iron evaporation source uh, where we have extremely low deposition rates so that we can get really individual iron atoms then. And you see that uh, we have here in the field of view two iron atoms, and they are actually absorbed uh, at two inequivalent adsorption sites. This is the first thing to uh, notice uh, if we do really experiments on the single atom level. 
meaning that we can have an iron atom absorbed on a HCP uh, type hollow site, or we can have an iron atom absorbed on FCC type hollow site. And amazingly, we can already see the difference in constant current STM height profiles, as you can see here. So there's a tiny height difference uh, between these two types of iron atoms on the two different adsorption sites. Now, uh, interestingly now, uh, if we look now at the Shiba states, that means if we go to low energy spectroscopy, where we measure the differential tunneling conductance as a function of bias voltage, then we can see an enormous difference in the Shiba states between iron atoms adsorbed on HCP sites shown in red and iron atoms show, uh, adsorbed on FCC sites. Uh, in black, you can see basically the spectrum on the bare rhenium uh, 0001 substrate. So you see that there is basically a state almost exactly at zero energy for the iron atoms on HCP sites. Uh, whereas for iron atoms on FCC sites, basically uh, the nature of these states is completely different. If we subtract the rhenium background spectrum, then you see more clearly uh, the states corresponding to the iron atoms. So certainly there's a two component structure uh, for the Shiba states uh, of the iron atoms on the FCC sites. Uh, and it seems that there is only a single peak here uh, at zero uh, bias if we measure with a platinum iridium tip at about 300 millikelvin. Now, the problem is uh, that the energy resolution with a normal metal tip, uh, even at 300 millikelvin, is not sufficient uh, to probe uh, uh, the nature of this state. It has been pointed out in the uh, second torque uh, earlier on that uh, for iron atoms on iron tellurium selenium, uh, such kind of observations have been uh, basically assigned to uh, Majorana state features. But of course, this is not a Majorana state. Uh, here, of course, we have uh, a completely different system. Iron atoms on rhenium, not on iron, tellurium, selenium. And I can easily demonstrate you now by going towards the niobium tip, uh, where we basically have then uh, tunneling between super, two superconductors via the magnetic impurity, um, where uh, we can drastically enhance the energy resolution because of the very peaked uh, uh, density of states of the superconducting niobium tip, that indeed we have a, a two component structure here uh, of this state. And uh, if we zoom into uh, really extremely small energy scales here, you can see we have a Shiba bound state energy of only 20 microelectron volts. This is just by chance that the Shiba bound state energy uh, is so small for iron atoms adsorbed on F HCP sites, whereas for the iron atoms adsorbed on FCC sites, the Shiba bound state energy is on the order of 100 micro EV. And uh, this is observable even with a normal metal tip at 300 millikelvin. But you need the superconducting probe tip to resolve the two component structure of the Shiba bound state for the iron atoms on the HCP sites. So that was, uh, of course, just to uh, add uh, to the discussion about uh, observations of uh, zero bias peaks for individual iron impurities. So for here, we can say for sure that we are not starting off uh, with a topological uh, state of the substrate like for iron tellurium selenium. This is just another example that you have to be extremely careful in the interpretation, uh, even for spectroscopy on uh, single iron impurities. Now, let me go further now. Now we want to construct uh, basically one-dimensional Shiba chains uh, uh, from the individual iron atoms. And uh, we would like to do this, of course, in an extremely well-defined way. So we make sure by local tunneling spectroscopy that each individual atom which we add to those chains are indeed iron atoms. We make sure, because we have seen the difference between the different adsorption sites, that all the iron atoms then reside on the same adsorption site with respect to the superconducting rhenium 0001 substrate lattice. And of course, we have to make sure that we start off with an atomically clean rhenium 0001 substrate. Of course, uh, if you know uh, surface science techniques, you know how to do this. So in the following, I will show you just a sequence of construction 
of uh, 40 iron atom chains uh, linearly arranged um, with a close packed spacing of 0.274 nanometers. This is exactly the lattice constant of rhenium 0001 substrate. All the iron atoms then are absorbed on HCP sites in the end. And as you see, we can really get a perfect chain, no impurity. Uh, Everything is defined, all the adsorption sites, the lattice spacing, the uh, uh, chemical species. So there's uh, everything defined in this type of experiment. The next step is of course to probe the spin texture. And this we can do uh, by uh, not only observing uh, the topography with a non-magnetic STM tip, this is a perspective view, where you see that you have a very uh, smooth, uh, uh, a constant current profile in the topography. And this is due to the fact that we have a very smooth density of states of these uh, metallic chains. This is quite well known. But if we go uh, towards spin polarized probe tips where we either do measurements with a, a out of plane spin sensitive tip or with a in plane spin sensitive tip, you see in addition, of course, uh, a modulation here uh, superimposed on top of the topography, both uh, if we look at the out of plane and the in plane spin channel. So we can analyze this quantitatively by doing one dimensional Fourier transforms of uh, these data sets. And this is shown here. So in black, you see basically uh, the Fourier transform of this data with a non magnetic tip. In red, you see uh, basically the Fourier transform of this data with the out of plane spin sensitive tip. And in blue, you see the data uh, obtained with the in plane spin sensitive tip. And you can see, of course, here the trivial peak, which just corresponds to the atomic periodicity along the chain. But here uh, you see that with the spin sensitive tips, you get two additional peaks here. Uh, and uh, uh, since you get this with both type of tips, it means that the ground state cannot be ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. It must be a non-collinear uh, spin ground state. And uh, uh, this is the model which basically fits uh, the data best. Uh, so it's a spin spiral with a unique rotational sense. And this spiral with a unique rotational sense is basically uh, stabilized by interfacial charge and schimria interactions, which are very strong for iron uh, rhenium interfaces, as can also be shown by theory. Now you get a spiral, as you can see, with an almost four atom periodicity along uh, the chain direction. And uh, that means that you have an angle of uh, basically 90 degrees from one atomic side to the other. So we know exactly the spin texture of those chains. Uh, so this basically is a perfect realization of uh, the early uh, theoretical models. And so the next step is now really to probe the electronic states emerging in such a perfect system. So on the next slide, you see now basically both ends of these perfect chains and uh, the topography is shown so that we can correlate uh, the ends, the topographic ends of the chains now with the spatially resolved maps of the differential tunneling conductance, which basically is a measure of the spatial distribution of the local density of states. So we measure basically the differential tunneling conductance as a function of bias. This is on the bare rhenium substrate right next to the iron chain. This is on the rhenium substrate far away from the iron chain. You see basically a difference here in uh, the appearance of the gap. Uh, so you see that the gap is slightly modified uh, of the rhenium substrate close to the iron chain. But this is just to indicate now uh, where we are in energy. So we will sweep the energy from plus one milli electron volt to minus one milli electron volt. And uh, you will see then uh, what's happening with the electronic state. So we uh, start outside of the energy gap of the superconductor. And now as we approach now uh, the gap of the superconducting greenium, we will see the emergence of uh, in-gap states. And uh, this will happen now. So we see in-gap states inside the wire, but we see in particular here a very strong spectral weight appearing here right at zero energy. Uh, you see this beautifully at both ends of the chains, but you also see 
that uh, there is also a, a spectroscopic uh, weight here inside who wires, and this is uh, basically coming from the Shiba states. And you see this more clearly. If we go now away from zero bias, then you see that uh, uh, these features are becoming much more pronounced. Actually, this is a, a kind of Van Hove singularity in one dimensional Shiba band. And then, of course, we go outside of the gap, and uh, this is no longer interesting in principle. So uh, let me discuss now. Uh, in more detail, uh, what's happening now if we go uh, from very small uh, chain lengths to chains up to 40 iron atoms now. So these are plots where we basically have here on the x-axis the spatial coordinate, and here on the y-axis we have the energy, meaning that here we basically can uh, look at a zero bias conductance profiles. And this is shown basically here, zero bias conductance profiles here as a function of chain length from uh, three iron atom chains up to 40 iron atom chains. And you can see obviously that uh, there is some, uh, some additional uh, zero bias conductance emerging for longer and longer chain lengths. Um, this is something we have quantified. So here again, there's the zero bias conductance plotted as a function of chain length given by the number of iron atoms in the chain. Now here for the center of the chains, you can see also some zero bias conductance coming actually from the Shiba states. But you see that when we exceed a certain critical chain length, then we get an additional enhancement at the ends of the chains. This is shown in red here. And uh, this happens approximately above uh, 12 iron atoms in the chains. So this is a quite interesting observation. And uh, we have tried to understand this theoretically. Now, the beauty is that uh, we know everything in our system. We know, of course, the chemical species. We know exactly the adsorption sites. We know the atomic distances. Uh, we know the spin texture in the iron chain. So we can do up initial calculations, of course, based on this input. And then from the up initial parameters, we can then do tight binding model calculations. These were done by Tore Poske exactly for this uh, system we are looking at here. And Tore Poske uh, has calculated basically what happens to the zero energy end states for exactly these type of chains as a function of chain length. Starting here with eight iron atom chains, 10 iron atom chains, and you see that you get a very strong hybridization of the states uh, from both ends. Only uh, if we go towards 20, 30, 40 iron atoms, then we get a, a clear separation of uh, uh, zero energy modes here uh, of both ends. And of course, uh, you can also calculate then the uh, phase diagram, uh, the topological phase diagram exactly for these iron chains on rhenium 0001, where we have here the chemical potential as a function of exchange splitting J. And for our parameters, of course, which we have calculated uh, uh, from our up initial uh, studies, uh, we can conclude that we are deeply in the topologically non-trivial regime. And uh, this uh, allowed us to assign these states uh, to my runner uh, states. And this is what we have recorded uh, about three years back in time. Now, of course, as we all know, uh, it's not sufficient uh, for kind of smoking gun experiment just to look at uh, these uh, zero energy modes at the ends of such chains. And this is why we have done a lot of uh, different kind of experiments over the past three years. Uh, so this, of course, involves uh, a variation of the magnetic uh, atom type. Uh, we look for various types of transition metals like iron, uh, cobalt, manganese, chromium. And of course, we were also looking to various kinds of superconducting substrates, not only rhenium, but also tantalum, uh, niobium. Uh, and uh, this is what I'm going to show you next. So uh, probably it's uh, very uh, interesting to see that if we just replace iron by cobalt, uh, so also fabricating a cobalt chain now with 84 cobalt atoms, also on HCP sites, also linearly arranged, 
with a closed pack spacing. So basically the structure is exactly the same. The substrate is exactly the same. And if we do spectroscopy on these three spots now and compare that with the spectrum on the bare rhenium substrate, you will see a surprise. So here is the differential tunneling conductance as a function of energy. And all four spectra on the bare substrate shown in gray dotted uh, curve here and uh, here uh, uh, for the three different locations here, uh, uh, you see basically that all these spectra coincide. This is amazing. Uh, this means that in the low energy regime, uh, this cobalt chain looks completely transparent. Why could that be? Now, of course, this can only be explained if we uh, bring together experiment and theory as we always should. And it was uh, Levente Rocha who calculated nicely uh, the magnetic moments of cobalt atoms on different adsorption sites. And he found that for cobalt atoms on HCP adsorption sites on rhenium 0001, you have a very special situation and you, you get a complete quenching of the magnetic moment. So that means that these cobalt atoms on these particular adsorption sites are non-magnetic. And therefore, of course, you do not observe any in-gap Shiva states uh, in agreement with experiment. And of course, you will never get uh, then uh, zero energy end states. So this is a kind of warning. You cannot say, OK, you just uh, work uh, with uh, magnetic transition metals on any kind of superconductor, and uh, you will uh, see this kind of physics. We have, of course, done the same kind of experiment with manganese without observation of any end states. I don't have time to go into this. I will now go to very recent work, which is much more exciting, where we replace the rhenium by niobium. And the motivation is very clear uh, because we would like to get to an elemental superconductor with a much higher transition temperature so that we also have a much larger superconducting gap, which allows us to resolve in-gap states much more clearly. So let me come now to artificially build manganese chains on clean niobium-110. Now, why niobium-110? That surface orientation was chosen purposely because this kind of surface orientation has lower symmetry. It only has two-fold symmetry uh, compared to the rhenium-001 uh, surface, which has three-fold symmetry. You will see that this allows us, of course, to create many different inequivalent manganese chains in different inequivalent crystallographic directions with respect to the niobium-110 substrate. But first, let's have a look to the Shiva states of individual uh, manganese atoms on clean niobium-110. If I say clean niobium-110, uh, this is, of course, uh, still something which is quite demanding from the surface science point of view. So we really achieved relatively large areas free of any impurities. There are some spots left here uh, appearing dark in constant current STM topographs. So here we still have a few residual um, oxide patterns, but uh, the area which is free of any impurities is large enough to do the types of experiments I'm going to show you. So of course, we were looking here at a manganese impurity um, on a clean part of the niobium-110 surface. And first, let's have a look uh, to the Shiva states. That means let's have a look to the differential tunneling conductance as a function of energy. So in gray, you see uh, uh, basically the spectrum on the bare substrate. So a beautiful hard gap, of course, uh, of the uh, niobium substrate. And then in red, you see, of course, the spectrum measured on top of manganese impurity. And now you can observe various peaks which appear more pronounced, less pronounced. Uh, or some peaks also very close to the Fermi energy. We have labeled these peaks alpha, beta, gamma, delta. For the following, it's relevant that the alpha state is more, most pronounced. Here you can see the spatial distribution of the alpha state, of the beta state, of the gamma state, and the delta state. So uh, here, obviously, we have a multi-orbital Shiba impurity system. So the multi-orbital nature can be seen by the many different uh, uh, peaks here in the spectrum, but you can directly visualize also the orbital nature of uh, these different Shiva states. 
So this multi-orbital nature will become very important later on for the interpretation of our data. Now, as I said, since we have a two-fold symmetric substrate, we can build now chains in inequivalent crystallographic directions. For instance, this is the O01 direction here. Uh, this is one minus one O direction here. So this is basically uh, the schematics which corresponds here to these uh, images. Here actually uh, uh, the crystallographic uh, axes are different here in this uh, uh, view here of uh, the STM topograph. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is simply a sequence uh, where we built now one dimensional chains uh, starting from a single manganese atom. And uh, as before for the iron chains on rhenium, uh, we construct perfect chains without any disorder. All the uh, chains are here, which I'm going to show you next, consist of individual manganese atoms on this clean niobium substrate. So this is the chain in one minus one O direction. We also build chains in the O one direction and also in the one minus one one direction, as you will see later on. So as in the first part of the talk, the first duty is now to characterize the spin texture of all those chains. So again, now we switch towards uh, spin polarized STM. And um, here you see, uh, once again, the schematics for, uh, uh, for manganese chains now uh, in a uh, 001 direction. Here, a close packed manganese chain, and here, a chain with a double atomic spacing here. So uh, what we do is now we characterize uh, uh, the magnetic state uh, with spin polarized STM, either with chromium tips or with Shiba state tips. Uh, this uh, is actually reported uh, earlier this year. Uh, with a Shiba state tip, we can actually achieve 100% spin polarization uh, in our measurements because uh, uh, basically Shiba states uh, are 100% spin polarized. So uh, that's a very nice trick to enhance uh, spin contrast. And you can beautifully see for this chain, uh, which was assembled in the 001 direction with a uh, spacing uh, here like this, um, uh, that you have obviously an antiferromagnetic ordering. So you do basically spin polarized contrast imaging here in opposite magnetic fields. And then you can basically uh, extract the spin asymmetry map, which gives you beautifully uh, the spin uh, information. And uh, if you go for a close back chain, you will see now here that you have a hard time to resolve the individual atoms. Um, uh, in contrast to this type of chain with a much larger spacing between atoms. But uh, still you can uh, uh, then from the spin polarization map uh, conclude safely uh, that here you have a ferromagnetic chain uh, from this unique uh, contrast here um, in the spin asymmetry map. Uh, I can immediately prove that uh, if there would be an antiferromagnetic ground state, we can see it because here we have indeed a chain now which was assembled in a one minus one one direction uh, with a closed packed spacing. So this is actually such kind of chain. And here we see indeed an antiferromagnetic uh, ground state. So we can resolve this uh, by spin mapping uh, even for closed packed chains where we have a ferromagnetic or an antiferromagnetic ground state. So this is the summary here of the most important uh, chain systems I'm going to address next. Uh, by the way, I would like to add already that we did all these studies already also for iron and for cobalt chains. Uh, so it was uh, really a very extended study. Uh, so in the following, I will show you now results for manganese chains, uh, which were assembled in the O01 direction with a ferromagnetic uh, ground state. And in particular later on, uh, I will also focus for ma on manganese chains uh, assembled in the one minus one O direction uh, with uh, closed back spacing. These are uh, the chains which are uh, uh, also having a ferromagnetic ground state. Now, let me discuss now a very important point. Uh, so as I said, uh, for the iron chains on rhenium, uh, which we reported earlier on, there were uh, basically uh, two uh, points uh, of concern. First of all, that uh, the zero energy modes uh, were quite close to the Shiva states and uh, we did not achieve a very nice separation of those states at that time. Uh, but secondly, uh, 
in our experiments, as well as in all previously reported experiments, people usually uh, looked at these uh, zero energy end modes. Now, here I would like to discuss, of course, uh, a step uh, further. So by uh, looking at the topological transition in a simple Kitaev chain model. So here we consider a one-dimensional Kitaev chain where we basically have E0 here as the on-site energy. We have here T1 as the nearest neighbor hopping term. Uh, we have delta 1 as the superconducting pairing energy scale. Uh, A is our lattice constant, K is our wave vector then. And as you all know, as a, a function of the T1 parameter, the hopping parameter, of course, uh, we can then get a transition from a trivial to a, to a topological non-trivial uh, regime. And this is shown here uh, for a kind of 1D model calculation for 20 atomic side chain. And uh, uh, here we see two kinds of plots, energy versus K, but also very important plots for the following, where we have here energy versus site. Uh, that means these are the atomic sites along the chains. And of course, if we uh, are in the topologically uh, non-trivial regime, uh, we should, of course, uh, get uh, these uh, zero energy modes right at the ends of the chain, which is very nicely reproduced in these very simple 1D model calculations. Now, the point I would like to make is that everybody, of course, so far uh, was looking at these zero energy modes with STM or so. But why not really uh, looking uh, to the bulk band structure? Bulk band structure means, of course, that we are looking also to states inside the chain. And uh, this we can, of course, do by uh, recording data where we have here energy versus atomic side. And this you will exactly see in the following. So the idea is probing not only the zero energy end states, but also the bulk band structure of a 1D chain and looking for the bulk boundary con correspondence. And this is exactly what you see now for manganese chains, which have 17 or 20 atoms here along the chain. These are the topographies. And here are the corresponding data sets, raw data, where we plot here the energy uh, here as a function of spatial coordinate along the chains here. And you see immediately, of course, that uh, here we do not observe any uh, zero energy modes, but we observe extremely nicely here the Shiba bands. Uh, we see also very nicely, of course, if a chain length changes, then of course, we see different kinds of periodicities. Where are these periodicities coming from? What we are looking at here is nothing else than Bogolyubov quasar particle interference in finite Shiba chains. So what you get is basically here periodic patterns uh, uh, which result from uh, uh, the interference of the quasar particle uh, Bogolyubov states inside these chains. Now, the beauty is now, and uh, uh, this can be done, of course, for many different data sets, that by Fourier transforming this data, because it has so excellent quality, you can look at the states in Fourier space. So here, basically, we have now the energy as a function of Q vector. Q vector is, of course, a scattering vector between the K vectors um, uh, here. And what we see is now beautifully uh, the states uh, basically energy resolved and also uh, somehow a Q vector resolved. Now, we can zoom in into more details here. And you see that at low energies, basically, we have two different types of bands. We have an alpha band, which basically shows features of a topological band. Uh, you see here within a very simple Shiba chain model for the so-called alpha Shiba band that the black experimental data points can be fitted extremely nicely. This is uh, the red curve here by such a simple uh, Shiba band model. Now, the point is that if that would be only a one band uh, situation, then of course, this kind uh, of model would lead to zero energy modes, to Majorana modes at both ends of the chain. But this is not what we observe experimentally. So here in this experiment, there is no zero energy mode here at the end. Our interpretation is that it is 
this second band, what we call delta band, which actually is derived from the delta states of the individual manganese impurities. So it could be that due to the fact that we have not a single band situation, but we have, that we have two bands here that we do not observe uh, basically here my runner uh, zero modes here in this particular system. That seems to be quite unfortunate, but at least we have already learned now what kind of techniques we can apply uh, to get information about the bulk band structure of our chains, not just looking at the zero energy modes. But once we have that idea, of course, then we can go a step forward and ask ourselves, is it possible to construct a situation where we have an effective realization of a one band model? And this is, of course, uh, quite straightforward now because we are making use of the anisotropy on this niobium 110 surface. Uh, so it means that we have an inequivalent situation if we uh, artificially build chains in the O1 direction or in the one minus 10 direction. What is different in particular is that the low energy states, which are so decisive, and these are the delta states, can much better hybridize than uh, if we go for chains in a one minus one O direction. And uh, as we will see, this allows actually uh, to create uh, an effective one band system. And as it has been shown previously, for instance, by Pientka von Oppen and co-workers in this work in 2013, uh, a one band model for low energy Shiba bands basically results almost always in a topological system in a topological state. And this is exactly what uh, will be shown next. So here, indeed, we have fabricated manganese chains here, the example of a manganese 32 atom chain on niobium 110 along the one, uh, one minus one O direction. So this is this direction here uh, with respect to the niobium uh, 110 lattice. Uh, so uh, we have quite large separation still between uh, the manganese atoms here, but still this is a closed back chain here uh, with respect to the niobium uh, uh, adsorption sites. Now what you can see here, if we look first of all to the differential tunneling conductance as a function of energy, that on the substrate, which is shown here by the gray spectrum, we have a beautiful hard gap here. At the chain ends, we get beautifully a zero energy mode, which is very well separated in energy from, uh, from the next states at the ends of the chain. And uh, for the chain center, we see that those states are even further uh, away in energy from the zero energy mode. If we go now for a spatial mapping of the state, so where we have here the X and the Y spatial coordinate, we can see, of course, very nicely uh, the spatial localization of the zero energy mode here at both ends of the chain. If we go away from zero energy, then we see, of course, states here inside the chain. These are, of course, the Shiba states here. And uh, we can beautifully identify the spatial uh, distribution of those states. But most importantly, we would like to now combine spatial information and energy information. So I will turn now to this different kind of plot which shows much better the energy separation of the zero energy modes and the trivial states. And this is shown here. So this is now again a manganese chain Again, in one minus one O direction. Again, we have been looking at chain lengths here uh, from basically a single atom up to about uh, uh, 45 uh, manganese atoms. So this is the one minus one O direction. And here I show data for 14 uh, manganese atom chain. Uh, here now I plot the spatial coordinate and here now energy. Uh, and you see clearly now here, basically the energy which corresponds to the superconducting coherence peaks of the niobium substrate. And now you see here beautifully uh, the zero energy mode with the very pronounced features at the ends of these chains. And you see now extremely nicely how large the energetic separation between the zero energy mode and the trivial states is. So these are, of course, uh, Shiva bands here, which have formed and which we can again analyze by Fourier transform uh, as shown before. But most importantly now for this system, 
and we just changed the crystallographic direction, we can clearly see now the zero energy mode. And this means that we have indeed now achieved an effective one band system. Now, I said before for the iron chains on rhenium that if we go for small chain lengths, then there might be a significant hybridization still between uh, the zero energy modes at both ends. And this is exactly what we see. And uh, I would like to show you this data as well. So here we have a manganese 14 chain with 14 manganese atoms. Here we have a manganese 16 chain with 16 manganese atoms. And you see beautifully the zero energy modes for these two chain lengths. However, for manganese 15 chain, you see that this mode is actually going away from zero energy. You see a splitting here, and we interpret this as a hybridization gap now. And this hybridization gap is explained by still a strong hybridization between both uh, ends here of the Mirana chain. If we do calculations for the LDOS for 32 manganese chain, this is shown here, then we basically can see uh, why we get this uh, periodic alternation uh, between the observation of the zero energy mode and this case where we observe this hybridization gap. The reason is that for this particular material combination, we get a very interesting relationship between the Fermi wavelength and the atomic periodicity along the chain, namely that half of the Fermi wavelength just corresponds approximately to twice uh, the atomic lattice spacing. And this is why uh, you get uh, a constructive or destructive interference basically as a function of the length of the chain. But I would like to make the point is uh, that we add one atom and we effectively modify both ends. So uh, in some sense, we do a local experiment on a single atom level, but the effect is non-local. This is a very important point. The effect is non-local. It's not local at the site where we uh, add the atom. This is why I show this data as well. Now, actually, you can do this experiment as a function of chain length. Here's the experimental data for uh, chains with an even number of atoms and here for an odd number of atoms. And you comp can compare this with a very simple Shiva band model. You see an almost perfect agreement. And you see that despite the very good localization of these Zerenchi modes, there's still a strong hybridization dependent on the chain length. So we will have to go to much larger chain lengths in the end, of course, uh, for the states actually to converge towards uh, zero energy nicely. So on the other hand, this perfect agreement means that we have indeed a beautiful realization of a, a one band model case and that there are no other bands now relevant close to the Fermi level for manganese chains in the one minus one O direction. I would also like to make the point at the very end that we also study hybridization between zero energy modes at uh, chain ends of two different chains. We can easily get that by introducing vacancy sites. So here we basically have six vacancy sites. Uh, uh, and that means that we still have some hybridization of the Majorana states from both ends. And we can also see then a hybridization gap here coming from the hybridization of these states. Now, how do we know that this is the reason? The reason is that we can do very uh, uh, well-defined experiments where we have then only five, four, three, two, one, or zero, zero vacancy sites. And we can study basically the hybridization gap uh, as a function of the number of vacancy sites. So this is the experimental result which we get here uh, for uh, basically uh, these states and the hybridization gap as a function of the number of vacancy sites. A very simple 1D model calculation shows also at least qualitatively uh, these kind of oscillations. However, uh, there's not yet a quantitative agreement, but at least very simple 1D model calculations can reproduce uh, at least uh, uh, qualitatively the experimental results. So in the end, 
of course, uh, the overall goal is uh, to go to much more complex structures which allow to investigate braiding of my runner end states. So we have a beautiful uh, theoretical proposals, of course, already almost 10 years back in time based on tri junctions where uh, uh, based on a sequence of operations here uh, of these uh, zero energy end modes, we could demonstrate some uh, kind of braiding. So these kind of structures can be realized uh, both with iron atoms on rhenium as well as manganese atoms on niobium. Uh, these are now the iron chains on rhenium. We can also go for much more complex network structures where we can also uh, basically test theories uh, which have predicted different uh, spectroscopic signatures depending on whether an even number of chains meet at a certain spot or uh, an odd number of chains. And of course, we can increase chain lengths here considerably to exclude basically hybridization, say, between that end mode and uh, this point. So this is currently going on. Uh, this is ongoing work. And I just would like to mention that we also did a lot of work on two dimensional systems. I don't have time to go into that, but uh, we have shown that iron islands uh, grown uh, epitaxially on oxidized rhenium actually allow to probe chiral myron edge modes here on superconducting iron islands. So there's a complete gapping of the states of the iron islands here. And uh, we only see the current Myron edge mode, which is perfectly reproduced by theory by Dirk Moore at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who did model calculations for exactly our system and has proven uh, by calculating the churn number for exactly this system that we are deeply in the topological non trivial regime. Now, in the end, we have in mind to combine our two dimensional islands and one dimensional spin chain systems to really create much more complex networks now of two dimensional and one dimensional systems. Then you can bring up even more exciting proposals of doing braiding. Uh, one uh, proposal is by Tori Posky here from the University of Hamburg. Um, I don't have time anymore to go into the details, just uh, uh, to give you ideas that, of course, you do not only have to stick to 1D systems, but also to combinations of 1 and 2D islands. And uh, in the end, of course, I would like to acknowledge all my co-workers involved in these experiments, especially Hovon Kim, who did the pioneering work on the iron chains on rhenium 0001. Lukas Schneider, Philip Beck, Jens Weber, who did the wonderful experiments on the manganese chains on Niobium 110, and uh, Levente Rocha doing the up initial calculations uh, for all these systems, Tore Poske doing the tight binding model calculations together with Michael Torvard. And I would like to acknowledge Dirk Moore and his group uh, in Chicago, and uh, Stefan Rachel from Melbourne. I would like to thank our funding agency, the European Research Council, for the third advance grant, now on the topic of atomic scale design of Myrana states and their innovative real space exploration. And of course, at the end, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor to questions now. Could I ask a couple of questions first? Uh, Go ahead, Shankar. Yeah, so Ron, very good talk and even much, much better work. I have not, I have been following it superficially. I know that you are doing a lot of work, but this is really terrific. So uh, let me sort my thought out. Uh, one thing that was worrying me, I think you have addressed it, but I want to probe a little bit further that lets you have a 30 atom or 32 atom or 25 atom uh, chain. To me, that sounds like a very short chain why are you not seeing mirror oscillations? Now, then you showed 14, 15 atom chain where you are seeing something that you're interpreting as mirror oscillation. What is your estimated coherence length? I mean, I would have thought the coherence length is longer than even 32 chain. Obviously, I'm wrong. Uh, what is the length scale? That's your meaning whether you will or will not see mirror oscillation. 32 atoms sounds so short to me, but obviously, uh, I'm wrong. So can you explain, please, uh, the length scales involved? Yeah, the length scales are on one hand, of course, uh, the superconducting coherence length scale, which is, of course, uh, much larger than any uh, other kind of length scale, uh, which is uh, uh, here of relevance uh, of the atomic chain uh, or, say, the localization yeah. of the end modes. Yeah? That's what I have thought. In that case, you are always in the, in the unprotected regime. 
because your wire length is much, much shorter than your coherence length. So, what so am I here I would perfectly I agree with you. So here I would perfectly agree with you. So if uh, we are talking about topologically protected states, yes. then of course we would uh, need to go uh, for much larger changes. Okay, okay. All right, so, so okay, here right. we are uh, perfectly uh, aligned, I would say. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I understand. So, That's your goal. Uh, that's if your we are goal, talking you have about, mm -hmm. but you have demonstrated the principle. Good, I'm happy. Okay, now I want to go back to the earlier part of the talk. Can we just discuss a little bit? There are a few minutes left. I do not have a good feel for metal physics. I haven't done metal physics. I haven't done metal physics with numbers lately. I do a lot of metal physics, but without numbers. So, can we discuss the numbers a little bit? My, let me tell you my concern. This is the concern I had when Jaydeep and I and Sumanto and I looked into the Princeton experiment, okay, which ended up in a fiasco. I should have never done it, but I did it. So in metals, everything is electron volt. That's the problem, okay? Everything is electron volt because it's real electron, not doped. And my concern is no matter how clean your system is, since the bar is electron volt, it's very hard. And even if it's very clean, any defect is like 10 milli electron volt. So can you educate me a little bit about the numbers that I should think about for your system? What's the topological gap? What's a typical uh, disorder scale? I mean, your system looks very clean, but that does not mean it's disorder free. You're... It is disorder free. So I can guarantee you okay. that each individual atom is uh, in the first part of the experiment uh, uh, iron. And uh, for the second uh, uh, experiment I discussed is manganese. Right. And we probed basically all uh, the regions around those chains. Mm -hmm. So there are no defect states uh, actually uh, which can uh, perturb the system. In I... fact, we did an experiment where defect sites are close. And then of course you get a modification. Uh, okay. And you will never be able for this order chain. I would like to make the point: this kind of experiment with the Fourier transform, uh, where we look at the states in Fourier space, uh, is never possible for the chains which were uh, basically obtained by self-assembly. And I think we should make this point clear. It so is this very is important. Point. This is why I'm proving it. Okay. By the Princeton group. So you okay. you can see here. Uh, basically from the spatial map of the differential tunneling conductance and also from the line section of a differential tunneling conductance that you have a disordered chain. Mm -hmm. For a crystalline chain, which was assumed theoretically by Andre Bernevik, okay. of course, you should have a periodic profile of your tunneling conductance. Mm -hmm. So this is not the case. You see here uh, clearly uh, that you have an extremely strongly disorder. And this is what I had in mind. Your chain is very different. Your chain is- This is completely different. We guarantee point. that we have a crystalline chain. This is not a crystalline chain. And the reason is that as a result of the self-assembly process, where you have to anneal the system, you get a severe intermixing between iron and lead. In the surface science community, it's very well known that lead is acting as a surfactant. That means that lead always wants to go on top of a transition metal like iron. So yeah. you will always get intermixing. And this is the reason why, uh, that you have this great uh, um, uh, disorder in these kind of chains. Right. Yeah? Right. So what you have is a material science breakthrough. And I, you have answered my question, actually. I should not think in terms of the crystalline iron and the energy scale of disorder there. That was true for Princeton measurement, not for your measurement. Yeah, so, exactly. It, and I would like to make the point in the theory result. This is, of course, theory uh, by Bernevik. And here you can see, of course, the periodic uh, features, yeah, which you should get if the chain is uh, without disorder. Correct. But this is clearly different from the experimental no, no, yes. data. I'm talking yeah. about the real system. Okay, good, good, good. So, so I don't understand. I should not think in terms of the bulk disorder in iron because your thing is not self-assembled. You're not using a, a very good point. So, so the energy scale issue is, is, is not, not. So, so that, that, I think you have answered my question. Other questions I had are all related to this issue. Yours is not a somewhat better Princeton sample. Yours is really a totally different kind of sample. Yeah, from the top point of view of uh, 
uh, disorder free system where we can basically now uh, get a one to one correspondence between the experimental data and the predictions based on Shiba chain physics. Yeah, yeah. there have been so all these, uh, the uh, papers by von Oppen and uh, many others, and we can really now have a, a beautiful realization experimentally of such perfect model type systems. Right. So then this is the last question, and it's this Shiba chain model, you know, Shiba Kitai chain model result that you showed and so on. What is its difference with the model we studied, you know, Nanoware, except in the Nanoware, we have to take VZ to be very, very large, which is the approach I took in this paper with Dumitrescu that we wrote, you know, Somata Tewari. We said, look, this is Nanoware with VZ so large that the spins are all kind of aligned, so it's ferromagnetic. Uh, is that equivalent or do you say it's not equivalent? Um, of course, uh, in our case, uh, we can uh, only modify uh, certain parameters. We can definitely uh, uh, tune the nearest neighbor hopping by the different spacings, for instance, between uh, the magnetic impurities. We can, of course, also modify the superconducting pairing, basically the lattice constant, as I showed. But uh, what we cannot do, like in the field of semiconductor systems, uh, we cannot continuously change the chemical potential. Right. Yeah, right. That we is can right. change, of course, the species uh, by going towards different transition metals. We yeah. can, of course, also uh, choose different kind of superconducting substrates, but we cannot continuously right. uh, vary but the then chemical. Aren't you always stuck in either trivial or topological, whatever your system is? I mean, you have to go to a different chain, right? Because if you cannot tune the parameter, like the chemical potential in the Kitaev model, how in a single chain, either you are topological or you're non-topological, correct? Yeah, but you can, of course, for the same kind of chain, for the same kind of crystallographic direction, just modify the distance oh, uh, between okay. the All atoms. Right. So the hopping is the topological okay. transition there. Okay, so the hopping is. All right, thank you. I think these were my main questions. And now I understand your system much better. What do you what do you think your topological gap is to the extent you can kind of make a guess? Yeah, you can of course uh, infer that uh, from this kind of data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you so what, you basically can see uh, the separation basically of the zero energy mode to the next state, mm -hmm. which is approximately here. Uh, this is one milli electron volt, so it's a it's a few hundred micro EV. Now, is this data or is this theory or is it both? I'm, I'm slightly confused. The figure that you're showing, is this experimental data or is it theory? This is experimental data here. Yeah, experimental. Very good. So this is experimental yeah. data. This is not yeah. theory. <laughs> so it's a half an energy. Pretty, pretty decent. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. Thank you. I answered all my questions. I'm, I'm delighted. I can send you uh, the two more recent uh, publications. One will come out shortly in Nature Physics about uh, the idea of Fourier transforming uh, these Shiba band uh, structures. Yeah. And uh, this data, as I said, is uh, currently submitted, uh, but I can sh uh, I can send you the preprint. Good. If it's not on archive, please send it to me. I'm very interested. Thank you very much. You have answered all my questions. I'm sorry I took over all the uh, time, but these are questions I had. I'm sorry, Danny. No problem. All right. But on that note, we do need to uh, move on to the next speaker. So thank you again uh, for an excellent talk, Professor Wiesendanger. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. And so our next speaker uh, will be Georges, uh, Katz, Professor Georges Katsaros. Um, let's see if, you, here we go. If you could now share your screen when you're. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. It is a great pleasure uh, to to present our results in this very nice uh, virtual conference. And uh, I'm going to speak about two different material platforms, namely indium arsenide aluminum full shell nanowires and proximity germanium whole gases. And as you see, I already questioned myself whether those are suitable platforms for the realization of Majorana zero modes, which means uh, I'm not going to, to show you the, the realization of Majorana zero modes. Despite the intense discussions of the past months and the disagreements about uh, data interpretation, 
I think what uh, unites us is the common dream that all of us would really love to find a machine which would be able to simulate nature. So of course we can ask ourselves, why are we not yet there? We are all working very hard. And for that, I would like to, to mention this paper by the group of Matthias Troyer, where they try to, they try to calculate the amount of qubits you would need in order to be able to, to calculate nitrogen fixation. So effectively to calculate how you transform atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia in a plant. So that, that, that work of the group of Matthias Troyer showed that actually you would need 111 uh, logical qubits. And then depending on the error rates of your qubits, uh, you would have a different number of physical qubits per logical qubit. And I would say for the current error rates of the available qubits around, you would need from 1,000 to, let's say, 10,000 uh, physical qubits in order to realize one logical qubit. And that's pretty demanding. A solution to this channel, to this uh, challenge, would be to be able to realize topological qubits, which have been predicted to have uh, greatly reduced error rates. And in the heart of these topological qubits are Majorana zero modes. So we all know, uh, Sankar presented it, and also the previous speakers, that in 2010, there have been a couple of very important theory papers which showed to us experimentalists that actually one can realize Majorana zero modes by simply coupling a semiconductor nanowire with strong spin orbit coupling with an SA wave superconductor. And under correct uh, conditions, one should be able to realize Majorana zero modes at the end of the nanowire edge. Recently, there have been additional, uh, in my opinion, interesting proposals how to realize Majorana zero modes in uh, planar Johnson junctions. And those proposals are interesting because uh, they predict that one will be able to realize Majorana zero modes at very small magnetic fields uh, by phase biasing. So it has been already nine years since the first uh, paper by Murik et al. Uh, in 2012, when Leo Kauvenhoven showed uh, the first signature of Majorana zero modes at the March meeting. And we are now in 2021, and we are still debating whether Majorana zero modes have been observed. So one, of course, asks oneself, what is the reason why we are still debating and we have not concluded or we have not moved on? Uh, one of the reasons is that, as has been shown, uh, Andre bound states can uh, perfectly mimic almost all the signatures of Majorana zero modes. And if you are interested in uh, reading more, uh, I advise you to take a look at the very nice Nature Review Physics paper, which appeared uh, last year. From my point of view, I want to give you uh, my, my opinion as an experimentalist, what are the difficulties which makes it very difficult to really conclude and, uh, and be sure whether uh, we have seen Majorana zero modes. Let's start again with a single band model where uh, which was uh, proposed in 2010. And uh, I think one of the big questions uh, is, in order to, to reach the topological phase, one needs to, to reach this condition. But the question for an experimentalist is, of course, what is the value of the electrochemical potential? Yes, we can tune it, but we don't know what it is. And as a consequence, we don't know at what field uh, Majorana should emerge. And if actually uh, you take a look at the literature, you will see that in the first paper reporting signature of Majoranas, uh, the zero bias peak was reported around 200 millitesla. In the same year in the Weizmann study, the zero bias peak was reported at 50 millitesla. In a Copenhagen paper a few years later, it was reported after one Tesla, and in another Copenhagen paper above two Tesla. And while the first work was in the one timonite nanowires, which have a large G factor, uh, those two works use uh, indium arsenide nanowires, which in principle should have the same G factor. Uh, an additional thing I would like to point out is that in some studies, you need to go very high in magnetic field. 
And that's an additional problem because for large values of magnetic field, the gap can become soft and that will make the interpretation of the experimental data uh, tricky and difficult. Just to uh, verify this once more, to elucidate once more, that's a work from my colleague Eduardo Lee back in 2012. So this is the pre-epitactual uh, growth of superconductors where you can see uh, the measured uh, superconducting gap versus the parallel magnetic field are already, if you apply uh, above uh, 75 millitesla, you can see beautiful how the gap becomes very soft. We all know that in 2014, 2015, we had the breakthrough by Peter Kroxer in Copenhagen that they could uh, grow epitactually aluminum on top of uh, their indium arsenide nanowires and that led to very hard gap. But still, if you carefully, carefully observe, also in that case, once you crank up the magnetic field, the subgap conductors is increasing. That is why we believe a full shell hybrid aluminum indium arsenide nanowires are a very interesting material to investigate in order to look for signatures of Majorana zero modes. Why is this so? Uh, Luchin in 2019 showed that uh, for this type of, of material, for full shell nanowires, you should be able to get uh, Majoranas at rather small magnetic fields. So actually in the first lobe, that's what, what you can see here is the density of states at the edge of the wire while here is in the bulk. So you see that in the first lobe, you get a zero bias peak. And a bit later, Fernando Penaranda uh, showed uh, uh, a similar result. So they calculated the, the destructive and the weak little parks effect in which they showed that you get zero bias peaks uh, due to Majorana zero modes in the odd lobes of the little parks. Before I move on, I would just like to remind you what are these lobes. When we think of uh, of a cylinder which is threaded by a, by a magnetic field, we all think of flux quantization. That's what we are used to. But if we make the, the thickness of the cylinder small, actually there is another term because the supercurrent density does not vanish within the cylinder. And then we go away from flux quantization and we end up with a flux solid quantization. What is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that the superfluid uh, velocity now links to the flux. And what one can see is that uh, the kinetic energy becomes a periodic function of the flux. And you can reach conditions in which the kinetic energy can exceed uh, the superconducting condensation energy. And if that happens, superconductivity will break down. And that's what I plot here. So in black are the areas where superconductivity exists. Uh, red are the metallic regime, which we call destructive regime. And from now on, I will call uh, this area the zeroth lobe, first lobe, and so on. And as I already told you, theory predicts that Majoranas should appear at, uh, at odd lobes. Let me once more uh, summarize why I think that this material system is interesting, is there is no fine tuning of the electrochemical potential. The Majorana zero modes will appear in the first lobe. So we know exactly at what field of, at what magnetic field they should appear. And another point I would like to make, uh, we will not be able to have a very big tunability because the electric field uh, is screened out by the superconductor, but that means that this will allow us to discriminate the physics happening in the tunnel junction from the physics happening inside the proximidized nanowire. So in 2020, uh, the Copenhagen group uh, showed uh, such zero bias peaks uh, in the first lobe, and uh, we found this, this material system very interesting. And when Marco Valentini joined my group as a master's student, we decided that this is really an interesting material system to take a look at. So what we are going to be studying are uh, full shell indium arsenide nanowires. So what you can see here, the red is the full shell nanowire. 
what is depicted in green is the, the bearing you arsenide nanowire after you have removed by transine the aluminum and we have our metallic contacts. The results I'm going to present now are in collaboration with the, with the Madrid guys, Fernando Peraranda, uh, Pablo San Jose, Elsa Prada and Ramon Aguado. And of course the nanowires have been provided by Peter Crockstrom. All the measurements I'm going to report have been done by Marco Valentini, so all the credit goes to him. The first question we wanted to, to, to answer was what is the correct value of X? What is the value of X we should choose in order to do our tunneling spectroscopy experiment? Mark, and so, and, and when, I, when I say correct is because when we want to do this experiment, we would like to, to be as close as possible to the Hamiltonian uh, which theories use, that we have the part which describes the hybrid nanowire, we have part which describes the lead, and then we have also uh, the part which describes the tunnel coupling, the tunneling between the, the normal lead and the hybrid nanowire. So when Marco joined the group, the first thing he did, he did the preliminary study to understand uh, when does this area act as a tunnel junction and when do we form a quantum dot? So our conclusion, our empirical conclusion is, and that number is valid just for this particular uh, uh, nanowire type. So for every nanowire, one needs to do this study and, and conclude what is the correct X. So for X smaller than 100 nanometer, we have no quantum dot in the junction. We call this short junction. And when X is bigger than 150 nanometers, there is a quantum dot formed in the junction. This we call long junction. And as you can see, there is, a, there is an area in between. This is the gray zone area where sometimes you have a quantum dot and sometimes not. So we avoid in our measurements that area. So let's start with short junction devices, X smaller than 100 nanometers. And uh, so now really the, group, the, the green area is going to act just as a tunnel barrier. The first experiment we do is we measure the differential conductance uh, versus the bias and the bucket voltage. And what you can see is that around minus 18 volts, you have a beautiful hard gap where the ratio between the subgap conductance and the conductance above gap is, is more than two orders of magnitude. And what we then do is we, we, we stay at this value of gate voltage and we start uh, ramping the magnetic field you can see beautifully the little Parks effect, but there is no zero bias peak in the first low. So uh, we wanted then to, to make sure that that has nothing to do with, uh, with the transparency of our tunnel junction. So what Marco then did, so he fixed uh, the magnetic field in the center of the first low, and then he started sweeping the bug gate voltage. And again, you can see that uh, as can be verified by all these line scans, that independent of the transparency, there is no Majorana zero mode uh, uh, appearing in the first lobe. Uh, of course, we then decided we, we need to, to reproduce it. We need to make more measurements. So, so Marco measured eight more devices. I show here the results. On the left side, you can always uh, see the measurement we do in order to characterize the gap. So it's always differential conductance versus voltage and buck gate, while here you see the little parks measurement. And what I show in the, in the bottom right is the dimension of the tunnel junction. So we have measured, here I show four devices, here you can see four more devices. And if you take now a, a line scan, if you plot the differential conductance versus the bias, at zero millitesla and at the center of each lobe, you can see that for none of the nine uh, short junction devices, we could see any zero bias peak. And uh, we, we then decided to extract uh, the dimensions of the wires, at least to have a feeling what are the real dimensions of the wires we are measuring. You can do that by using the Landau-Ginzburg formula. And if you do so, uh, we see that uh, the diameter of uh, the radius of our nanowire is from 60 to 67. Uh, the thickness of the superconductor ranges from 21 to 29, 
and the coherence length from 150 to 175. We did uh, also measurements on, on another type of device. So what I've been discussing so far, uh, so far were the destructive little parks. If you change slightly the dimensions of the wire, you can measure the so-called weak little park effect, where now the kinetic energy of the Cooper pairs is never high enough to completely break down superconductivity. So we fabricated also out of such devices, short, uh, uh, short junction devices. And uh, Marco did similar measurements. So he measured the differential conductance versus the bias and the magnetic field. And again, you can see a beautiful little Parks effect, but you can you do not see any zero bias peak in the first lobe, in the third lobe, in the fifth lobe. So also for this type of uh, full chain nanowires, we could not observe any zero bias peak for the short junction regime. Of course, we were puzzled. Why don't we see it? And we don't have a clear answer at the moment. I think uh, the speculation is that either the spring sp spin orbit of indium arsenide is not strong enough to see it, or in principle, it's strong enough, but it is very much uh, renormalized by the superconductor. So it loses it. Uh, Eric explained very nice in his talk uh, late, uh, pre uh, earlier today that effectively the superconductor can wash out uh, the spin orbit energy if it's, if it's too strongly coupled. Or maybe we have simply uh, wrong wire dimensions. So in the future, we will need to, to dig into this to see why we have not observed any zero bias peaks. We then moved on and uh, we said, OK, let's have a quantum dot in our junction. So now, on purpose, we have created a quantum dot in the tunnel junction. And of course, that uh, quantum dot is proximitized by a superconductor. So we will be able to study Andrea physics UCR states, and uh, just to be clear, our singlets will be of UCR type because our devices have a charging energy, which is much bigger than that. So let's start uh, investigating these long junction devices. So again, we measure the differential conductance versus bias and bucket voltage. You can see beautiful um, uh, signatures of Andreev bound states singlet ground state, doublet ground state. And we start our study by, by focusing first on doublet ground state. So we focus in this area that simply a zoom in, zero magnetic field. And then we, we crank up our magnetic field. If you do so, you will see that the energy of the subgap state is increasing. Why is this so? Because if you are in the doublet state and you apply a magnetic field, you will have a Zeeman splitting. And that will lead to the fact that the observed subgap state is uh, increasing in energy. And that's in agreement with what Eduardo Liedal reported back in 2014 uh, uh, for, for a similar uh, nanowire system. So let's now fix our gate voltage at the, in the doublet ground state and let's uh, sweep our magnetic field. So now we don't see just the beautiful little park oscillation, but we see also how the Andreev bound states evolve. And actually we can verify that these are UCR states uh, because there is a pretty nice uh, match between the experimental data and the analytical UCR equation. Interestingly, if you take a closer look in the destructive regime, you will see here uh, two peak-like features. Let's take some line scans. You see that you have a split peak. Please remember, we are in the doublet ground state. So we have a spin one half system, which is now very strongly coupled to two metals because we have killed superconductivity. So that leads to condo physics. So practically what you see here is uh, that we have uh, uh, a split condo peak. And how do we verify that we have a condo effect? We did a temperature dependence and indeed uh, the, the conductance drops. So we can now use the condo effect simply to extract the G factor. And here I would once more like to point out that this G factor is now the G factor of the non-proximitized indium arsenide nanowire. So that is not the G factor 
of the of the nanowire which is covered by the food chain. So then let's move on to the singlet ground state uh, investigation. So we move on uh, at the gate voltage range a bit uh, a bit uh, lower than minus two. And uh, again, we zoom in zero magnetic field. We crank up the magnetic field. And now what you see is that the feature, the subgap state splits in two. And also that makes sense because if you have a singlet ground state and you apply a magnetic field, the doublet splits. And now we are going to observe two transitions. And also that is in line with what Eduardo uh, reported back in 2014. And obviously, as we all can see, that in that case, when you have a single ground state, you can create a zero bias peak. So let's see this. We fix our gate voltage and we are going to, to ramp our magnetic field. And you can see how uh, the two uh, subgap states are approaching each other more and more, and you get a zero bias peak in the second lobe. Just to make it clear, that's obviously no Majorana. Uh, a Majorana should appear in the first lobe and not in the second. Of course, we can focus also to other uh, singlet states, which, which we take in this area, and we repeat the same experiment. And what you can see now is how we can tune uh, our, uh, our zero bias peak. Here it is not really in the second lobe, but you can see how you eventually can create a zero bias peak in the first lobe. Again, we investigated also the weak little parts regime. Just to keep it short, again, you see beautiful Andre F bound states. And depending on where you fix your, your gate voltage, you can end up with a zero bias peak in the first lobe or with a zero bias peak in the fourth lobe. So obviously, those are not uh, Majorana zero modes. But we investigated further many more devices. And then we found a couple of devices in which there is no obvious subgap state in the zeroth lobe, and you get zero bias peaks in the first lobe. So then our question was, are those Majorana zero modes? Because the first question we were trying to understand is, how can it be that uh, non-visible hidden and draft bound states in the gap could lead to a zero bias peak in the first lobe? Just to, to refresh your memory, in order that we could see a zero bias peak in the first lobe based on Andreev bound state physics, we needed to have the subgap state very close to zero energy already at zero magnetic field. So, so that really triggered our, uh, our uh, interest whether indeed we had seen Majoranas. So then we started investigating further these devices. So what I show now for each device is a line scan at zero magnetic field and a line scan at the center of the first lobe. So you see a beautiful hard gap in the, at, at the zero lobe at zero magnetic field. And in the first lobe, you see a small peak. Uh, no obvious signature of Andreev bound states. That's a bit different for that device. Again, we have a zero bias peak in the first lobe. But here already, you can see that there are some features close to the gap. And finally, if you go to device C, you see again a zero bias peak in the first lobe and some shoulders uh, at zero magnetic field. So uh, let's take a closer look to these devices. So that, let's start from device C. And now what I'm going to show you is the area from which we have extracted it. So practically, that is the area where we have fixed our gate voltage. And then we, we swept uh, the magnetic field. And I guess you agree with me that uh, this is a beautiful Andreev bound state. And now what I'm going to show you is I'm going to, to take a zoom in this area, but in the center of the first lobe. And you will see that what appears is to have a zero bias peak for roughly 100 millivolts, which then disappears. And if you carefully take line scans, you will see that actually you have two peaks which merge together to a zero bias peak, and then they split again. Uh, one point I would like to make uh, is that these 100 millivolt actually correspond to roughly half a diamond. So 
what appears to be a rather robust uh, peak is actually not a robust peak. If you would kill superconductivity and you would take a diamond plot, you would see that that distance is not even half the distance between two Coulomb peaks. We did the same study for device E, same trick. Uh, here is where that measurement has been taken. If you take uh, the plotted zero magnetic field and you measure the differential conductance versus bias and backgate voltage, you will see that also this device is, is full with uh, Andreev bound states. Actually, in some case, it seems that we have more than one pair of Andreev bound states. And again, what I'm going to show you now here is a zoom in in this area, but for a magnetic field corresponding to the first uh, lobe, to the center of the first lobe. And again, here, you will see that for some area, you have a zero bias peak. And if you just go a bit away, again, this zero bias peak disappears. But now I go again back to my, to my initial kind of question, which made us think in the beginning that we had seen Majorana zero modes. How is it possible that an Andreev bound state uh, will give you a, a zero bias peak in the first lobe? So uh, what I present here are uh, simulations from the, from the Madrid team. So what you can see here is how the Andreev bound states would split in case you would have a pure Zeeman effect. And uh, what you see here in black are the poles of the green functions if you solve the superconducting Anderson model. So now the question is, how is the little Parks effect going to, to modify this plot? And for that, I will guide you through the phase diagram. So that's the little Park effect. So here we have superconductivity, destructive regime, superconductivity. At zero flux, we have the characteristic uh, dome picture. Here we have a doublet state. Here we have a singlet state. And uh, if you crank up uh, the magnetic field, you can see that the dome is increasing. And now what, what you can see if you, if you carefully analyze the problem and you, and you check the polarization versus um, uh, the ratio between gamma S and the charging energy, and if you sit at a value a bit below 0.5, you will see that at zero magnetic field, at zero flux, you are in a singlet ground state. At 0.3, you are at a singlet. But then when you crank up the flux, you can uh, become, uh, you can make a quantum phase transition and end up in a doublet state. And that's what uh, is represented here. So in red are the poles of the green function. So you can end up uh, to have a, at 0 0.9 flux uh, quantum phase transition. So how does this really look for our device? So this is now the simulated LDOS uh, for the plot shown on the left side. So you can see that actually under such conditions, you might end up with a zero bias peak in the first low, because if you put broadening on the poles of the green functions, as we have in all our experiments, uh, you will get uh, actually a zero bias peak. And I would like to point out that the parameters used for this simulation are matching with, uh, with the, uh, are matching and were extracted from the measurements of this device. So effectively, what we see here is uh, nothing else than a, a singlet to drop to doublet uh, phase transition. And due to the broadening, uh, it appears as, as a zero bias peak. So one last time, you start in a singlet ground state. And when you crank up the magnetic field and you end up in the first low, you simply make the transition. So. I hope I, I have convinced you that uh, uh, full-shell nanowires are really a good platform in order to be able to, to distinguish Majoranas from trivial states, because uh, we, we know where, where we should see them. And uh, if we vary experimental parameters, they should not move away from the first lobe, else they are not. We could not observe any signature of Majorana zero modes uh, for short junction devices. And I hope I've convinced you that ABS can perfectly mimic Majorana zero modes. So what we need to do in the future, we need to check how we are going to decouple our superconductor from the Indy Marsanet nanowire, 
hoping that that will allow uh, a much stronger spin orbit, and then we will uh, investigate whether we can observe Majorana zero modes in this platform. In the beginning of my talk, I told you that recently there have been a couple of uh, theory papers which suggest that planar Johnson junctions are uh, very interesting in order to realize topological superconductivity at very low magnetic fields due to phase biasing. Actually, I think just a few months ago, there has been a, even a, a newer paper in which they show that even at zero magnetic field, uh, you should be able to realize topological superconductivity. And based on those proposals, they have been already two experimental works. Uh, this work is uh, on indium arsenide planar devices. This is mercury telluride in which practically they used a flux in order to do phase biasing and they reported uh, signatures of topological superconductivity. Uh, what I'm going to try to, to convince you is that germanium might be a, a very interesting material system to, to look uh, into if one is interested in topological superconductivity. And I'm quite sure that the majority of you might be surprised because uh, nobody works really uh, with holes looking for topological superconductivity. My two arguments is argument one, uh, germanium hole gases have a very high mobility. Here I just uh, mentioned a paper of 2016 of the Warwick group where they have a hole gas exceeding a mobility of 1 million where they could uh, measure the fractional quantum hole effect. And the other point I would like to make is that actually germanium has a stronger spin orbit than indium arsenide and indium antimonide. And the spin orbit is, is also electrically tunable. So we believe that that's an interesting material system to take a look at. And especially if we dream that one day we will observe Majorana zero modes and we would like to couple, to couple them to spin qubits as, being, as has been proposed by, by, by several groups, uh, germanium is actually a great material platform because uh, very uh, long lived and electrically controlled qubits have been realized. And in general, if you would like to, to learn more about germanium, uh, I, I would uh, recommend this article, which gives a, a very nice overview. But going back to superconductivity in planar germanium. So in 2019, there have been two works which address superconductivity in planar germanium. And uh, the, the left work is uh, a work by, done in CA Grenoble. The right is a work done uh, at TU Delft. So what you see here is a two-dimensional germanium hole gas. You have the germanium quantum well uh, sandwiched between the silicon germanium spacer uh, so practically here you have the, the Johnson junction, here you have a top gate, and they could tune, they effectively could uh, make a JOFET, Johnson field effect transistors, and they could tune the, the critical currents. And in the Grenoble group, they could reach I, ICRN products uh, of about eight microvolt. In the DEF group, they could reach higher critical currents and ICRN projects of, of 16. Uh, what I'm going to report uh, uh, now are results which we have observed, obtained uh, by using Delft wafers. So those wafers are grown in the group of Giordano Scapucci. This work has been done by, by Kushagra Agarwal, who is now a PhD student at Oxford. And we have very much profited by the collaboration with Jeroen Danon and by the group of uh, Jordi Arbiol, who did uh, high resolution TF. So the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to improve the semiconductor superconductor interface. So in Germanium, we are still uh, a step back. So we are in the pre-epitaxial superconductor phase. So the results I'm going to show you are really by uh, metal evaporation, e-beam evaporation of the superconductor. So it's important to be able to improve this interface because else, instead of getting an ref reflection, which is what we would like to, we will get normal reflection. So what we aim at is to get an as high as possible transparency, which means Z equal to zero, so that we would ideally uh, the conductance and get two times two E square over H. 
So what has been the approach in, in the group? So what Kushagra decided is to get directly access to the germanium quantum well. So directly access means we are going to etch away the silicon germanium spacer in order that we can directly contact germanium. And uh, the second critical step, of course, is how do you passivate the interface? So Kushagra found out that uh, if you do an SF6 passivation, the interface uh, dramatically improves. And uh, that he showed already with the first generation of devices, which initially are just germanium quantum well contacted by aluminum. So we have a Gelson junction. Uh, so this is the aluminum in blue. And what you see in yellow is the top gate. What, what uh, this image shows is a cross-section TM picture. You see the germanium quantum well, silicon germanium, where our aluminum contacts germanium and we have hafnium oxide as a, as a dielectric. If now we measure the, the critical current, so effectively we measure, we do a four probe measurement, uh, we send the current and we measure the potential drop, and this allows us to extract the critical current. So indeed we can tune uh, the critical current quite a bit. And uh, already in this first generation of devices, Kushagara could get an ICRN product of around uh, 40 to 50, which is already three times increased compared to, to what had been reported for germanium. Of course, we wanted to, to increase, we wanted to enhance superconductivity. So it's always good to look uh, back to see what, what uh, smart people have already done. And Kushagra found a paper of the 90s in which it was shown that if you couple niobium with aluminum, uh, one can really enlarge the superconducting gap of aluminum. And that is what Kushagra did. So in the second generation of devices now, instead of having just aluminum, uh, our contact is now, now niobium aluminum, uh, just to elucidate this a bit more. So that's our germanium quantum well. Aluminum is in direct contact with the quantum well, and niobium is contacting aluminum. It is true that here you will see there is a still a small area of niobium in direct contact with germanium. However, if you take a closer look into the TM, you will see that that part is oxidized. Uh, so niobium does not give a direct contact to germanium. So niobium just contacts aluminum. Uh, that's what you can see here. So that's our aluminum contact. Now we have aluminum oxide as, uh, as a gate electric, and uh, this is our niob niobium contact. By repeating the same four probe measurements, what Kushagra could see is that he dramatically increased the critical current. Remember before with aluminum, we had something like 150. Now we have a critical current uh, which approaches one microampere. And uh, if now you measure ICRN as a figure of merit, you see that that he could go up to 350 microvolts. So that's an obvious important improvement, uh, enhancement of superconductivity. And of course, the next step is to see what about uh, the gap. So if now you measure the differential resistance versus the bias, practically what you can see are uh, several peaks, which are due to multiple Andreev reflections. And if you, plot the position of the peaks versus uh, bias, uh, practically that allows you to extract the gap. And we extract a gap of roughly speaking 460 microelectron volt. Let me remind you, aluminum has a gap of 0.2, so 200 microelectron volt, niobium much larger. So we obviously did not manage to, to approach too much to niobium, but already that, doubled uh, the aluminum gap. So let's see what is the influence of this uh, for the magnetic field resilience. And these are the two measurements which I show you here. On the left side, I plot you the differential resistance versus the applied current in the perpendicular magnetic field. And uh, what you see here, which looks maybe like switches because it's a, it's a low resolution measurement, it's actually uh, due to the fact that we have also the, the Fraunhofer effect on top uh, of the standard uh, keeling 
of the superconducting gap. And if you check the, the cleaner measurement for in-plane field, you can see that we get a critical field exceeding 1.75 Tesla, which is one order of magnitude higher than when we had uh, simply aluminum. But I motivated you, uh, my interest, I motivated my interest in germanium because we would like to do phase biasing. So let's see what we can do. Well, step by step. So the first step is to check whether we can do screen devices. So that's again a step back. What I show you here are uh, purely aluminum devices. So we have uh, what you see now in dark is the aluminum. We have two gates and we fix our upper junction to have a critical current of 25 nanoampere. And then you can sweep uh, practically, you, you can change the critical current of your lower junction. And you can see that you go from a textbook uh, squid behavior where the oscillation of the current, uh, so where the total current vanishes uh, in between to, to still an oscillation without a vanishing current to finally a Fraunhofer pattern. So let's do the same now for a device with aluminum niobium. Uh, so we have uh, one Joe Fett, a second Joe Fett. We can characterize them independently by switching one on. Uh, while the other is off. So you can see that uh, the one has a slightly higher uh, critical current. And now what we can do is we can, uh, again, uh, choose the gate voltage that they have the same critical current, and then we get a beautiful squid pattern. But of course, if we want to, to phase bias our device, what we are going to do is we are going to choose a different configuration in which the one, uh, the one junction is very on while the other is rather off. And now what you can see is a rather skewed pattern because all the phase difference goes to, uh, to, to the device which has a smaller uh, critical current. And now we can use uh, uh, this measurement in order to, to extract uh, the, the transmission barrier. So practically we, we extract the, the critical current values uh, we plot them versus uh, the phase, and effectively, uh, based on, on that formula, we can extract the average transmission. And here I would like to point out, obviously, we do not have one channel. We have many channels. We believe that we have between 50 and 100, but that is just an average uh, uh, transmission value if we would assume that we have just one channel. So that's where we are now. Uh, I hope I have convinced you that uh, we are able to create highly transparent interface between aluminum and germanium. We can increase superconductivity by coupling niobium to aluminum. And we have demonstrated uh, that we can do phase biased experiments. And obviously now uh, as a next step, we need to, to, to see if uh, there will be signatures of topological superconductivity. And with that, I have already reached uh, the end of my talk. I would just like to once more acknowledge all the people who have been involved in the work. Uh, the Indium Arsenal Nanowire work has been done by Marco Valentini, uh, the Germanium Hall Gas by Kushagra, and we have very much profited by the collaboration with the theories from Madrid, from Trondheim. Uh, we have got beautiful material from Copenhagen in Delft, and uh, the collaboration with Jordi Arbiol has been very crucial in order to be able to understand the behavior of our devices. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, let's open up the floor to questions. I'll wait for others to ask questions since I have been dominating the questioning session. But then again, the conference is just for me. So it's okay for me to dominate the question, but I'll still wait. Uh, uh, because people are sometimes, people take a little time. I mean, so I'll let you decide, Danny, when you decide that, no, I should ask my question, okay? Sounds good. Do we have any questions from anyone who isn't Chakar? <laughs> it's allowed, even in my conference, others can ask questions. All right, go ahead, Shankar. All right, I, let me go ahead. 
very nice work, you know, very, very nice. I didn't know about it. I heard about it in the APS March meeting in this very bad symposium. There was this very bright light for me, your talk. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my first question is this germanium work looks very interesting. And in fact, I'm in touch, well, that group has been in touch with me for a couple of years now for the materials part of it, you know, the, the quality, the 2D, because you know, their main interest is spin qubit, right? So, so uh, they have been in touch with me for quite a while. I think they're putting my name in all their proposals. I said, as long as I don't get any money, you can put my name, so it's okay. Uh, so that part looks very interesting and I, I, I wish you good luck. And if you get something, in the Mayoran angle, uh, I would very much like to know about it and I'm sure I'm going to hear from Delta also. But my question is on the first part and the question is sound kind of nasty, but I don't mean it in a nasty way. I, I really am perplexed. What is the advantage of this full shell? Other than the fact it gives experimentalists more nature and science that they can put in their CV. What is the advantage? I see a huge disadvantage. Spin orbit coupling goes down. Okay, so the magnetic field may be a bit smaller, but as you pointed out by showing actual data, that is magnetic field thing is quite, we don't know what the G factor is and so on and so forth. So it's, it's an open question. I really am open to be persuaded that the full shell system has some advantages. Could you so, please persuade me? If, yes. Please. So, so, so from my point of view as an experimentalist, assuming that we do not kill the spin orbit, that's, that's an open question, which I will agree. But assuming that we don't kill the spin orbit, we will get a Majorana zero mode at the first lobe. So if I get a zero bias peak in the second lobe, I already know that that has nothing to do with the Majorana. Th that's point number one. Okay, so let me understand the point. Just hold on. So what you are saying, I already have a diagnostic. If I get in the first lobe, I'm very happy. So that's very good is what you're saying. I didn't think about that. You have a point there. That and if I cannot move it away from the first lobe, yeah, because yeah. if so I get saying? something in the first lobe and I can shift it to the second, then okay. it's not a Majorana. Okay, it's a, it's a good point that a diagnostic is built into the experiment that if you sit in the first lobe, you are happy. Okay, all right, that's, that's a good point. And the other thing which I believe, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of this discussion whether experimentalists try to follow theory in order to get uh, what, what theory predicts by fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Here, when I apply an electric field, my electric field will tune just the tunnel junction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot tune anything in the wire. So in some sense, I can fool myself much less. Yeah. And as an experimentalist, I like that. Okay, I, so, I accept that also. That's an advantage in the current environment. But in reality, that's a disadvantage. That means you have one fewer tuning parameter. But in the current environment, as you, you know my viewpoint very clearly, in current environment, it's a big advantage. It does not allow the experimentalists to do confirmation bias. You know, one fewer parameters, OK? And in some sense, I prefer that we measure in the lab 15 or 20 different nanowires, yes. with different dimensions, yes. different composition, Yes. A different uh, superconductor. So to, to, to spend my time in tuning in that direction rather than trying to fine tune a single device. My dream is one day we will find a robust signature. Yep, yep, yep. Be because I really believe that uh, as a community also, we need uh, to, to, to decide when do we when do we decide that we have seen a, a zero bias peak? How many? What well, zero bias peak? You mean Meurana, right? When you have well, seen. E well, even for a zero bias peak, I would say, what is the percentage of the devices? Yeah. I think already that is a first step to say, okay, I did 10 devices, I saw it in one. Yeah. Then I would already say, okay, is this what we are looking for? Because there needs to be some reproducibility. No, I think, I think you have answered my question very well. Nobody explained it that way, that there is a diagnostic built into the experiment. It has less flexibility. So- On, so, on that, I fully agree. Yeah, less you flexibility. cannot cheat yourself. The experimentalist cannot cheat himself or herself. And that's yes. a huge advantage, I agree. But my concern is, so should somebody, meaning should I then, we here, 
look into this, this uh, you know, there is, a, there is a balance here, right? Spin orbit coupling strength is going down, but you have some other advantage. But, you know, if the spin orbit coupling goes way down, you have nothing. So maybe you should look at it quantitatively, you know, how much it goes down, which Roman really didn't do. I mean, you know, maybe he's doing it now. I'll talk to him, of course. But it sounds like that will be helpful to you, right? I, I fully agree. That would be a very interesting study. And, uh, and if there is a theory prediction, what could be a shell to be put on indium arsenide and yes. how thin or thick it should be, yes. that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think you have persuaded me that it's worth thinking about. You know, I was not thinking about it at all. Okay, good, good, good. Very good. On that note, I think I'll shut up because it's rare I learned something. I just learned something. That you see something in the first lobe, it's almost like victory. If you don't see it, it doesn't matter what you see in second law, which is the which is the theme of your talk, but I didn't get it. That is decisive. What you are saying is decisive. That that's our perspective. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So. Uh, Go ahead, Jay. Okay. So so maybe just following up on Shankar's, and maybe I, I'm missing some. I'm I'm missing some the subtlety here too. Uh, so. Be, be, just to uh, so so because we don't we don't tune the chemical potential. My worry is that this is a nightmare system in the sense that um, in the sense that you you your your device could just maybe just never have you could just you're at the mercy of whatever the chemical potential did, and and so you're you're stuck being outside a topological regime for good, um, and then maybe what's in the in the first lobe is an Andrea state like you're saying, and then we're. Then we're yes, but, stuck, right? but I, I've, I've shown you how I can move away an Andreev state. I see. I, and, and this is always like you, you can't, it, 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 there's, there, it, it, there's no danger of it getting stuck. Well, in all the experiments we have done, let me try. I'm scrolling back. Yeah, the, I, I just missed this probably. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let me, I'm trying to scroll back. It is a bit slow, my PC. Uh, so, uh let me maybe let's okay i think my screen froze out it's okay. coming so effectively what we have shown is that you can you can really uh i'm approaching that what you see here and that marco has verified so so you see here we have a zero bias peak which comes from Andrev, mm -hmm. but we can shift it away. So there is no Andrev which we cannot shift away. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because the magnet, the Zeeman field. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is the zero level experiment you can do on these wires, and that's why I think they are very interesting for distinguishing Majoranas from Andrev. If we are able to shift them away the zero bias from the first lobe, it is not a Majorana. Sure. Uh, and I, that's I, a very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm worried about sort of the second, the, the other scenario. Like, so suppose, cause some of these, some of these Andrea states are really, uh, the, the theory proposed Andrea states that come from inhomogeneous potentials are really like the, the quasi, they, they have also been called quasi Majoranas. They are almost Majorana. And I would imagine that they also do not respond to Zeeman fields very much. Well, so far, what I can tell you experimentally, we have not seen any feature which mm -hmm. does not respond to uh, the okay. gate voltage <laughs> value. All right. And, 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 you know, that gate voltage value tunes everything which is in the tunnel barrier. Maybe just once more to repeat. Mm -hmm. It would not influence mm -hmm. due to screening what happens in the hybridized nanowire. So already mm -hmm. that tells you what you see is not wire physics, but is junction physics. Okay, all right. Okay, excellent, yeah, thanks. All right, if there's one more short question, we have another um, couple of minutes. Is there anyone with an outstanding question? All right, in that case, uh, thank you again for an excellent talk. And uh, we are going to take a 
two minute break uh, before we move on to the next talk. <laughs> 